Hello and welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. We are back once again in your ears with a brand new case. And I'm joined by, of course, the lavishly lawless, the lethally lethargic, the little layabout, Ben Carter. How you doing? That's probably the nicest one so far. Cute. Lavish. Wow. Lavishly lawless, yeah. We're a bit bold. Hang around yeah. playgrounds and stuff. No, but how you doing, no, no, ben? Lawless like Rob Banks and stuff. Cool. Give it away. Yeah, blood banks for children. But uh, how you doing? <laughs> How are you that fucking quick? Um, <laughs> doing really well, thanks, Tom. Um, we are f- well, we're almost halfway through this series. I can't believe how quickly things are moving. Um, almost can't keep up. But doing really well. How are you, producer Dan? Very good. Very excited for today. Um, never been to New, Ze- New Zealand before, so... Can't even say it. <laughs> never been to New Zealand before, but I've never been that side of the world at all, so very excited. I, f- I feel like it's somewhere you would absolutely love. It's very you. It's where Frodo lives, isn't it? Yeah, yes. well, Shire. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of that. Yeah, I think Shire is its, its own place, own entity. But um, you yes. fools! Oh, and yeah, I'm actually going to be testing you guys a little bit on some uh, some New Zealand knowledge later on as well. Ooh, I like because I was struggling to get some light moments in this case, so I've I've I'm had to kind of do a bit of work preparing for it. So I'm excited to test you guys on that, and excited to delve into this absolute uh, carnage of a case. Yeah, it's our well. We've not we've not really covered too many cases over that side of the world, um, but it's it's arguably one of the biggest cases that's ever happened there, and it's a very divisive one. Although I'm not personally sure why it's so divisive, um, but we'll we'll go into that. But it's uh, one that we were just talking before we came on. Dan doesn't know anything about this case. I'm fascinated to see what he thinks of it. I'm fascinated to see what you think of it, and I'm fascinated to see what our lovely audience think. We've been putting a lot of polls on our social media recently to get opinions on the cases we've covered so far, and we tend to be have quite an agreeable following. Yeah, we've done things like, is Ted Bundy a looker? Most people said, not really. We said, uh, is Michael Peterson guilty? The majority of people said he was guilty, but I like the fact there was a fair few people active in the owl theory, the owl camp. The owl crowd. And also with the Enfield case, uh, a lot of people saying, it's just those girls having a laugh. They're having a laugh. So, uh, yeah, that was, I think it was always going to go that way. But also, I just want to rest assured, people, we are doing some kind of different cases this, this uh, series, but we're not going to go fully into the paranormal. We're not, uh, you know, we're not pivoting towards paranormal stuff. It's just a case we wanted to have a few, you know, different ones like we always do every series. Yeah, a little dip our toe into that spooky pool of uh, paranormal activity. And it was a fun one. I felt like we were very giggly in that episode. Mm. Um, so we've got it out of our system for today's case. Maybe. <laughs> And we hope you guys enjoyed last week's case of Stanford Experiment. Uh, again, a bit of a different one, but uh, we are back once again where, you know, back to where our bread is buttered. True crime. Um, buttered in blood, which is horrible. Jam. It's just jam. It's just, it's just jam. <laughs> this could be a good throw to the new merch. I'm talking about foodstuffs. Uh, we have a true crime twist. <laughs> our new uh, merch range, the Sony Side Up merch range, has, has got three new characters added to it. And so why not go head over to the website and check them out? We're very happy with them. And shout out to Ben Aitken for the designs. Absolutely smashed it. Uh, but yes, why not head over there and, and, you know, join the crew. Absolutely. And one other small, small plug before we jump into the episode. If you are listening uh, via any audio platform or if you're watching on YouTube, please consider taking a couple of minutes to go over to truecrimeawards.co.uk and voting for your boys ICMAP for listener's choice or viewer's choice or both if you've got four minutes that would be that would be lovely but we're yeah we're up we're up for a couple of awards and the cool thing about that is is quite often for these awards i'm sure a lot of you will know or might not know is you often have to pay to be even in running for it but um we were approached by them and they wanted us to be involved so yeah we're buzzing with that and we'll be buzzing to if we get any support from you guys it's much appreciated uh we don't do it for the rewards because we have never won one. So, uh, but yeah, if you have a bit of time, then, then why not head over? Ben, when did this uh, voting close? It closes at the end of March, the final day of March. Is it a 29-day month? I believe it might be. One of the late 20s of March. I hope it's not a 30-day month. It's not, is it? It wouldn't be a 29-day month, would it? Yeah, 30, what, 31 days in March. Yeah. That's embarrassing for me. Get the votes in before March 29th. Then you've got a couple of days to rest. Is that why you think you're so young? Because you just... <laughs> 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 but enough of us waffling on this week's case is of course the bain family murders also known as the case that divided new zealand the david bain case the dunedin massacre was it david or was it robin 
Is that yours, Ben? It's, it's not. It's kind of that's that's out there. I can't claim that one, but the, some people have literally gone it, the the case of David or was it Robin? Um, which that's a terrible. I, I just name. prefer was it Robin or was it David? Uh, well, I, I prefer the Bain family murders as a title. Hmm. Hey, the shit. <laughs> Don't put me the list. Yeah, <laughs> I needed one more. I needed an even five. Even five. It's not been a good start. This <laughs> twenty nine day months <laughs> and five's an even number. Anyway, to save Ben's blushes, Danny Boy, can you please set the scene for this week's case? The Bain family murders has long been regarded as one of New Zealand's most infamous and disturbing criminal cases. The tragic events unfolded during the early hours of June 20th, 1994, in the city of Dunedin, when five members of the Bain family were found dead in their home, whilst the sixth member, the family's eldest son, David, remained unharmed. Amongst the chaotic and ghastly scene, a cryptic message was left on the family computer. Was it the work of an intruder? Was a murder-suicide conducted by one of the other family members? Or was David responsible for his family's demise? The case has taken many dramatic twists and turns over the years, leading to public debate and significant controversy, marking the Bain family murders as the most widely discussed and divisive case in New Zealand criminal history. So yeah, if you're not familiar with this case, you're you're in for a, a very interesting and dramatic ride. It's um it's a very bleak and upsetting case, but there are a lot of twists and turns, and it's the only case I can kind of think that's kind of similar that we've covered before is the White House Farm murders. Um with kind of almost similar outcomes. Um but yeah, very divisive still. There's uh people in the the David camp, the Robin camp, not many people in the intruder camp, which I found surprising. Yeah, I think um, from from my understanding, it, well, you know, we'll get into it. It very much does point one way, really, and then because the defence are very much leaning on the other way, I think people were just, I don't know, intruder things seem to be looked over like very quickly, and, and I don't know why it was dismissed so quickly, but um, yeah, it's always seemed to be two clear narratives that people spin here. So it's a very, I have a feeling, we haven't talked about this, I have a feeling Tom and I have probably got the same opinion about this case, but there are still... Um, people in the with the opposite view of us as we'll go into um, but it's a very fascinating case and one that's the reason we picked it is because obviously we, we're interested in doing cases all over the world but the, the Bain family one in particular does keep coming up in our audience vote um, every season so we do one episode which is an audience vote and there's usually a few votes for that um, and yeah it's uh, it's uh, it's a definitely an interesting one to include in this series and as always we're going to start the episode with a quote and this quote itself actually comes from David Bain's appeal hearing the fact that I've been taken from my normal way of life, where I always avoided confrontation and promoted reconciliation, and have been dumped into such a violent society without warning or any form of preparation, caused me great distress. Not only was there the physical affront, I also suffered the alienation of the public and all my friends. The separation from the world is the worst punishment the state can impose on a person. There were times when I considered giving up the fight and ending the suffering by taking my life. I had no help from the system and only survived because I was willing to ask for help and I knew that I was innocent. So we're going to look at the dynamics of the Bain family, as well as a bit of background on them, before moving on to our timeline, aftermath, and opinions on the case. David Cullen Bain was born on the 27th of March 1972 in the city of Dunedin, New Zealand. He was the first of four children born to Robin Irvin Bain and Margaret Arawa Cullen, having two younger sisters, Arawa and Laniette, as well as younger brother Stephen. There's quite some interesting names there. Yeah, I quite like the name Arawa. Sounds like... Does sound a bit Lord of the Ringsy, but Laniette sounds like a cross between uh, if you've got a lanyard but has a serviette on it. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Going around, I want you know uh, hands free, but <laughs> I get a bit mucky. I get a bit mucky. Uh, the family were highly religious and raised their children to be devout Christians. With Margaret in particular having a fascination with spiritualism, and Robin also occasionally teaching at his local church. A horrible note to make here, Robin and Margaret met at and were devout members of the Presbyterian First Church in Dunedin, and this would be the same church where their and their children's funerals would later be held. Both of David's parents were teachers at the time of his birth, with Robin working at a local high school and Margaret working at Dunedin Kindergarten Teachers College. Robin was described as incredibly strict, but also wouldn't turn to any of his teachings to his children in his classes, whilst Margaret was described as loud, a little cruel in her comments, and had an overpowering body odour. Imagine, no, don't really want that on your uh, comments. La rather... Loud, which is annoying. Cruel, you're mean and you stink. <laughs> mean, stinky, loud woman. Mm. Mm. Everyone has a type, Robin. 
Tinder <laughs> categories. It's a good bio, isn't it? Good bio. <laughs> Just a year and a half after David was born, whilst Margaret was heavily pregnant with Aroa, the couple made the decision to relocate from New Zealand to what has been described as a very outback region of New Britain Island in Papua New Guinea, which some people will abbreviate to PNG, which I really don't, I'm not on board with. I just, it irks me. In order to become missionary teachers while spreading the word of God. And though David hasn't talked at length about much of his time overseas, he makes it very clear that religion was a big part of he and his family's life from an early age. My father and mother became teachers and missionaries here and had left New Zealand in 1973 to spread the Christian word overseas and increase the knowledge of the world to those less fortunate. I grew up following Christian principles with the concepts of honour, integrity and compassion playing a strong part of our daily life. The island of New Britain itself is known for its beauty and ranging terrain, with large portions of the island being covered in mountains and rainforest and other more built-up areas being surrounded by beautiful beaches and reefs. Mr Frodo! You see photos of this, and it's it, very different to that. Um, very tropical-looking paradise. I, uh, I think uh, this little island itself looks, looks lovely. At the time, the main inhabitants of the island were historical enemies, the Tolais and the Bainings. Uh, and the Bainings, obviously, no relation to the Bains in this case. Uh, but the Baining people, who are believed to be the island's original inhabitants, are known to have quite a secretive and protective community, but they are also known for their infamous Baining fire dances. And um, I, I watched a couple of little videos of this. It is, it, 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 for me, quite scary. It looked very painful and chaotic, but basically the dance itself the like a big bonfire and they all have sort of uh, f f not fire sticks that's not the right term is it the right term that's a more sort of modernized version of fire sticks these days aren't there but they had bits of wood with fire on them lantern yeah sort of lanterns yeah wood lanterns wood lanterns <laughs> there what is the fucking technical term when you go like indiana jones exploring a cave that's a, yeah. a, wood, a wood lantern torch Fa <laughs> Fuck this. Got off to a blinding start in this episode. Yeah, so fire torches. Perfect. Per yeah, so fire torches, big bonfire in the middle, and they would do... Bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> do the farmer voice. What they would basically do in this situation is they would do the fire dance in which young men would wear elaborate animal masks. And yeah, from this I can only really see... Th it looks like the skeleton of Tweety Pie uh, from Looney Tunes. Do you remember him? Her? I, mean, I remember the little bird, yeah, canary. Yeah. yeah. Looks like the skeleton of Tweety Pie. Um, and basically they dance around the fire, but also jump through the fire. And this nighttime ritual is performed to celebrate births and the passing of family members. It's also used to initiate young men into adulthood, um, which are very niche. But do you remember the Jim Henson's dinosaurs? It was the growing of a tail or being able to howl. No, I don't remember that. No, well, yeah, sort of. I know that was a big part of your childhood, but I, I think love that show. I was thinking about getting a dinosaur's tattoo. Uh, very niche, very niche. You should do. Go, go with your creed one. Thank you, mate. The relationship between Robin and Margaret was very erratic indeed. The pair met whilst at church in the mid-1960s and were married by 1969, with four children joining the family over the following 11 years. The family would remain in Papua New Guinea throughout this time, where both Robin and Margaret seemed to take very different experiences from their time on the island. The couple would frequently get into fights in front of their children as well as their friends, but they would also be described as being very loving, very connected, and also very intimate with one another. Uh, and the latter would obviously gradually fade over time. As more children joined the Bain family, Margaret took a step back from her role as a teacher and would initially focus all of her attention on her children. Originally, the couple planned to stay on the island for three years before returning to New Zealand, but this would soon be extended to 15 years. Big stay, isn't it? Big stay. And it's not completely clear whose decision this was. Over this time, Margaret became more and more immersed in the local culture and became fascinated by different tribes on the island. As a result, she started to have quite an open mind to traditional healing, pagan rituals, the belief of spirits, reincarnation, alternative medicine, astrology, and the ability for people to possess special powers. Claiming that she was impressed by the elder women in her village who she claimed could heal people and also communicate with spirits through seances. 
one thing to note with Robin and with Margaret was a lot of times with Christianity, you know, it seems quite close minded. They're very like it's our way or nothing, but they were very open minded. They've been described as quite hippie with their kind of thoughts, very spiritual. And yeah, they just they believed in togetherness and they weren't at all alienating to other people's thoughts and, and the beliefs, which is quite refreshing. For David and his siblings, they were very much able to roam free around the island of New Britain because they had great phone data. And that's our week sponsor. Nah, I haven't could even do it, just roam freely. Their education was a mixture of homeschooling from their mother and lessons in the mail from correspondence schools. That's mail, M um, A I L. A lesson in a bag or an envelope. Yeah, it's like soap and a rope, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. They loved their time on the island exploring the rainforest, going camping, having beach day, sailing, scuba diving, and playing with other children in their village. Yeah, sounds like very outdoorsy. Lovely. I, I don't know if I would like to do scuba in. I didn't want to, well, I didn't not, I just get quite, like, spooked out. Yeah, the thought terrifies me. Mm. So that's the one time I've been really, really gutted about being colorblind, because I got down there and I couldn't, it, none of it made sense. I'd never seen those colours before in my life. Make your comments if you want. I get it. You didn't see the... You know. They were like new colours. Like I'd not seen them on land before. And my eyes were just so... My, my brain was so confused. My eyes were also confused. I'm confused with you trying to describe it. Becky. What happens when you see a rainbow? Because that's a spe- full colour spectrum. Like four colours. He's usually drunk in a club at that point. But um, <laughs> when you get a home base, and, home base and you look at like a paint, like the pattern like <clears throat> boards. Yeah. They all sort of merge if they're close together. I need it written. Like if I check the label of clothing, I need it to say, you know, brown, blue. Okay. <laughs> but no, that was, yeah, I went scuba diving in Australia and it got down there and there was just so many, cause all the fish, all the coral, just, there was so much going on. It was, it was an, an overwhelming sensory experience. Mm. But yeah. is that not a good thing? Or I like... loved it. But then I was like, I wish I knew what was going on. <laughs> I wish I knew what colours these were because it's beautiful. I just couldn't work it out. It's kind of sad in a way. Mm. Heartstrings. That tune. As time moved on, a dark cloud began to loom over the Bain family. In 1979, Robin was appointed deputy principal at Port Moresby Teacher School, also referred to as Port Moresby's Christian Academy. A Christian Academy. Uh, which meant that the family had to move from New Britain to the main island of Papua New Guinea. When they made this move, they were placed into a much more urbanised environment in housing compounds specifically for expats. This is obviously vastly very different to the life they've been living over in New Britain, and it's believed that Margaret and her children began to resent Robin for this move. Robin, throughout this, gets a lot of bad press from the kids and Margaret, and he's, from my understanding, just a very hard worker and quite a nice guy. Yeah, that's that was my take, and I know there are going to be people pointing out different elements or allegations against Robin, but that was my take as well. He seemed to be someone that just did everything for his family and not a lot for himself. But I can imagine, yeah, if they're loving life on uh, New Britain, on that island, just being able to do what they want, immersed in the culture, and then suddenly placed with a load of expats within a compound, I can mm. understand why they would not appreciate that that sort of change in environment. But yeah, for, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Throughout this case, all it is is people slagging off Robin. And it gets progressively worse. It's like a compound fracture within the family. Excellent. During this period, Margaret became more and more consumed with the beliefs of spirituality that was present in the people she had spent time with in New Britain. She became obsessed with concepts such as dream analysis, previous lives, channeling through seances, the possibility of demons and the spirit world. Yeah, so she's gone really deep into the other side there. Dream analysis is probably quite fun though. I dreamt last night... um, I was looking for uh, giraffe plants, which I'm not even sure if it is a thing, but it had the body of a giraffe, but I was just the, the vase, and really tall, uh, like n- just like a neck, really, of a, of, a, of a flower. Wow. Did you find it? Yeah, it was £91, <laughs> and that's about all I remember. I, f- I immediately thought that they existed, but they're elephant ear plants, um, that, because they've got like the giraffe pattern on the stem. Join us next week when we find out if Tom made the decision to buy the the, the uh, giraffe plant or not yeah definitely i wouldn't for 91 quid yeah, yeah that's that's a lot, a lot. and also our house is where plants come to die um, <laughs> as a result of this she neglected her other duties and the family home soon became chaotic and dirty whilst the children's homeschooling also became a mess so yeah uh it's this is another theme throughout this uh they don't really take care of their home environments uh it's been described by some people as kind of hoardery stressful to look at Therefore, the family made the decision to enrol David, who by this point is 12 years old, in a mainstream school. 
David found this adjustment incredibly difficult, and though he enjoyed his music lessons, he encountered a number of bullies. According to author James McNeish, the following incident took place not long after David was enrolled. Enjoy this one, Dan. David was set upon by two boys, slapped, kicked and thrown into a ditch by the school gate. A model plane he'd been holding fell to the ground and one of the boys, you're an... Oh, come on. That's unnecessary. It's the next bit that gets me. Don't urinate on a model plane. David was splashed. He didn't fight back. The question there is, did the kid knowingly hold on to the piss, waiting for this moment? Yeah, and did he aim for the plane intending for a splashback? Oh. Mm. Uh, an angled splashback, sorry. That's right. Terrible bullies, if so. Mm. But very prepared. Propel, 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 propel. <laughs> David found this incident very difficult to understand or to even talk about, which, yeah, I can appreciate. I would not tell anyone if that happened to me. It hasn't. Yet. <laughs> Someone shat on your toy truck. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason it splashed. Yeah, oh. And now you can only see brown, and that's the, the origin story. Yeah. So, I can't yeah, see the fishes. <laughs> So David, yeah, very impacted by this. Obviously, he'd been homeschooled and uh, had loads of friends on the other island, never had encountered bullies. And that is, yeah, again, jumping in the deep end of bullying. So yeah, really found it difficult to understand. He was very, very close with his mum and claimed to have a wonderfully close relationship with her. But when he tried to kind of explain what had happened, apparently she seemed very disinterested in it, um, as she had, at the time, found a new obsession in bottling fruits. So she was too busy bottling fruits to listen to David's story about his plane. And at the same time, he could not work up the nerve to tell his father about what had happened. And also, I would assume that Robin was away from the house so often working that they rarely sort of interacted. And David also did not tell his siblings about what had happened because obviously him being the eldest, he did not want to be seen as a weakling uh, when discussing it with them. The bullying cycle would continue for several months until teachers eventually intervened. This dark cloud above the Bain family continued to spread when in 1986, at a time when she was just 10 years old, the youngest Bain daughter, Laniette, was allegedly raped by a family friend on the island. And again, Laniette's word does come into question throughout this case and it will play a big part later in our timeline but she's claimed obviously to have been abused multiple times whilst she was on the island. A few years after this alleged incident there are additional allegations that Laniette had multiple abortions and also gave birth to a quote baby of mixed race. There are also allegations that her father Robin began to sexually molest as well as rape his own daughter with a secret incestual relationship continuing from here onwards. And yeah, these allegations would obviously go on to later play a significant role. The following year, obviously after many years of him struggling to adjust, Margaret made the decision to remove David from the school. And as she had now began to dedicate almost all of her time to her spiritualism, as well as religious beliefs, bottling fruits, she basically allowed David to simply roam around the compound uh, for most of the following year with locals describing David as appearing a completely solitary, emotionally blank and entirely aloof teenager. It's not a good Tinder bio. During the three years of 1986, 1987 and 1988, Margaret became increasingly more keen to return to New Zealand with her children. Her relationship with Robin had almost completely deteriorated, with her viewing Robin as a tyrant and even referring to him in one of her diary entries as a son of Belial, one of the four crown princes of hell. So yeah, that's quite a... Uh, Quite a name to be calling him. Also calling him Beelzebub. Calling your husband <laughs> one of the four crown princes of hell. Whilst Robin meanwhile informed his friends that he believed Margaret to be away with the fairies and that he believed she was more concerned with voodoo and using a keyring as a pendulum to tell her what God wanted to do than looking after the house and their children, both of which had become a mess. So yeah, by this stage, yeah, uh, it was no, uh, Margaret was known to go around shops and even knowing which kind of fruit or food to buy, she would use a pendulum in order to help her make decisions. So you're very indecisive. It's like that guy out of No Country for Old Men that makes his decisions on a coin toss. Mm, that's cooler though, isn't it? It's very cool. Not mm. what he does, but the coin toss. He probably doesn't do it for things like as little as that. Like, oh, should I get the prunes or should I get the, uh, the horseradish? They're very different <laughs> ingredients. Call it. Call it. <laughs> should I wipe? Just No, just wipe. Oh. Don't flip the coin. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Paul Morris, head of religious studies at Victoria University, was given access to Margaret's Papua New Guinea diaries, where he made the following observations. She was a very committed Christian of a very enthusiastic sort, and part of her faith, 
as manifested in the diaries, was an ongoing concern with the demonic. She worried about the devil in her family and the devil leading people to behave in particular ways. He would continue to state the following and make an analysis of Margaret's and Robin's relationship. Robin was failing to do all sorts of things he should be doing. My impression was that they were deeply estranged. There is a kind of distance feel about the way she wrote about all of them. Lots of negativity. What you get is a sort of toxic family environment. Seeing the devil being active on a daily basis in your household can't be conducive to family life. Seeing Satan around your family house, it isn't great for the vibe. <laughs> um, very odd thing to write. Wouldn't obviously recommend doing it regularly, but it could be a good excuse if, if uh, the accusations of Margaret not doing the family chores or the household chores. Maybe she saw the devil in the way of the dishes. Um, no one's here to react. Oh, yeah. Maybe they didn't. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> Morris then also expressed his concerns for the Bain children and the impact that their parents' relationship, as well as their personal views, must have had on each of them. She was concerned for all the kids. She was estranged from her family to the extent of seeing an utterly alien force there. I got the sense she wasn't there for them. My impression at the time was a terribly unhealthy psychological environment and she was progressively getting worse. This unseen parallel world was more and more dominant. It wasn't just a bit weird, it was an all-consuming weirdness. So yeah, this situation for the Bane children in particular is, is really difficult and um, must have been extremely chaotic in terms of their upbringing in that household. First of all, you have your, your father who's very, not, well, he's been described as being very absent, always working, always, you know, obsessed with, with uh, religion and teaching. Then you have the household environment, which is, a, well, we will go on to become semi-derelict, but also very untidy, very chaotic. And then you have your mother who has now really aligned herself with her spiritual beliefs and almost seems absent in the sense of being, a, a well, as Robin referred to, away with the fairies. So for the children, yeah, that must have been a really difficult household to be in. In December of 1988, the Bain family returned to New Zealand, having spent 15 years in Papua New Guinea. They moved into the same house that they owned prior to moving abroad, which, yeah, again, they, they kind of just neglected that house while they were away. They let family members stay in it, but it wasn't, the upkeep was not maintained um, and it had got in a, a pretty bad way. But this was number 65 Every Street in Anderson's Bay. And yeah, as I mentioned, the condition was not in the best of states. It had been described as being semi-derelict and there are photos of multiple rooms within the house that back this up. And obviously for the YouTube folks, we'll, we'll pop this up for you now. But yeah, every room, it just looks a little bit like not quite an episode of Hoarders, but guess there. Yeah, maybe the pilot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the pilot episode of Hoarders. After returning to New Zealand, David and his siblings struggled to adjust to their new way of life. David and his sister Arawa enrolled in Bayfield High School, where Arawa got on really well. She was said to have been extremely popular and had no problem making new friends, whilst David really struggled. He was also teased for his, quote, lankiness and big ears. And eating sauce cumbers, wasn't he? It does look, a yeah, that's fair. That's harsh, but fair. Not harsh. BFG, he's not really known to, for his looks. I've always thought he seemed a nice guy, but I love, yeah, lovely guy. No, don't backtrack it. Think he's no, no, person. There, I do. I oh, know that you've mentioned that. Yeah, it's a bit more of a humanized BFG, isn't he? Maybe less friendly. If we'll... well, yeah, that's true. Oh my god, he does. Sorry, it's all right. Crack it open. <laughs> um, real life BFG. Yeah, so he's really struggled to adjust. And as a result of the continued teasing, obviously he's the eldest sibling. He's not wanting to look weak in any way in front of his siblings, but ultimately became increasingly introverted and withdrawn, spending his... Sorry, right, sorry, I'm just going to... Bane family, BFG, Bane family, for, for just destroying... What's it do worth for, like, wiping out genocide? Yeah. Yes. Bane family genocide, BFG. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. It was necessary. He became, as a result of this, increasingly more introverted. He would spend his lunch times sitting by himself. However, after a year, David began to, you know, kind of adjust, settle down. He made a small circle of friends and also joined the school choir. And he was said to have been so good at singing that he eventually landed the lead role in the school's production of The Sound of Music. Isn't that a, w a woman? I've, I've never seen it. I, I just remember the woman running the field. Yeah, I would assume that that's the main character. Fair play to him. Baron Von Trapp. There you go. This newfound confidence also convinced David to enrol in university to study classical music, where he also joined an opera company called Opera Alive as a singer and took up competitive long-distance running. 
He bought himself a rifle and would regularly go rabbit hunting with it. He also got himself a girlfriend named Heather Gillies, who he'd regularly take to different productions and concerts. Two of his three siblings also seemed to adjust to life in New Zealand, but his younger sister Lynette seemed to continually experience challenges. David's father Robin spent the first few years back in New Zealand unemployed, and this continued to weigh heavy on he and Margaret's relationship, with Margaret opting to sleep in a caravan at the bottom of the garden rather than sleeping under the same roof as him. So yeah, a bit more on that. Um, they got the car caravan, apparently during the summer, Margaret would sleep out in there, but when it got all cold, she'd make Robin sleep in there. So <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, don't come knocking because the caravan is uh, it's freezing. Just think of a minute. Horrible. And, and there were as well, there were more than enough bedrooms in the house. It's a giant mm. house. But yeah, the, she did not want to be under the same roof. I guess if you believe your husband Satan, maybe um, you don't want to spend that much time with him. Yeah, but you'd still let Satan stay in, in your caravan at the bottom of the garden. Mm. That would still scare me if it was Satan. Keep your enemies close. That's true. And keep your friends further away. That's the expression, isn't it? It's also alleged that she referred to Robin as Belial or Belle to her children. Yes, yeah, she started using Belle a lot but that she would also claim to see Belle in her children and detect Belle in her house, as well as her husband. So obviously, yeah, Belle and Belial are still kind of within the Beelzebub kind of realm of uh, Satan and uh, all, all that is evil. So basically, she was seeing elements of, of her children that she believed to be evil, um, and Robin was kind of fully-fledged evil in her eyes. In 1991, Robin finally landed a job when he became the principal of Tairi Beach School, which was located around 35 minutes away from the family home. Obviously, we'll, we'll go into this in more detail, but I assume that this, this school would be on the other side of the island because Robin would basically commute uh, to school or to his job in a old comma camper van. So they had the caravan at the bottom of the garden, but they also had a comma camper van. And instead of commuting, you know, 35 minutes each way, Robin would leave the family home on a Monday morning and he would then most weeks uh, remain living in that van outside in the school parking lot until the Friday evening when he would then return home. But I suppose if when you go home, you're going to live in a caravan at the bottom of the garden and obviously the relationship is unhappy, but he, I, I would assume he would also want to be with his children. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really sad. So he would he would basically now take his life away in this camper van and be, you know, 35 minutes away from the rest of his family. As well as this, occasionally, to go back to the disturbing rumours regarding an alleged relationship that he held with his youngest daughter, Robin would take Laniette to stay in the camper van with him. When he would return to the family home for the weekends, Margaret would force him to stay at the caravan at the bottom of the garden while she returned to the house. The six-person family was surviving off of Robin's $500 a week salary, with Margaret only allowing Robin a weekly allowance of $50 of his own money. So yeah, the family had to live incredibly frugally, with David also eventually taking up work as a paperboy for the Otago Daily Times, basically getting a small amount of income each week. The Bain family home, meanwhile, was in a state of disrepair, with Margaret apparently hoping that it would all fall down so that she could build her own spiritual retreat in its place. Margaret also continued a habit of not spending all that much of her time looking after the house, and so it very quickly became incredibly dirty, cramped, mouldy and damp. Yeah, not a particularly nice place for a family to be growing up. She was reluctant to spend any money on repairs, and had also built a routine of staying in bed until early afternoon. Some of her former friends also claimed that she would try to recruit them to join her, quote, voodoo cult and then she would regularly conduct lessons and exorcisms of the family house caravan and camper van robin as a result of this spiraled into a deep and dark depression one of the key pieces of evidence often used to highlight robin's state of mind is the fact that numerous pupils of his aged between 9 and 14 wrote short stories about people that murdered their own families and also murdered police officers some of which robin bizarrely decided to publish as a focal point to the school's newsletter he also allegedly struck a young male student Yes, that's very, obviously, that's a very bizarre and disturbing thing for people between the ages of 9 and 14 to be doing that. A few years prior to this, in 1990, some of Robin's students had allegedly witnessed the Aramona massacre, wherein a 33-year-old man named David Gray went on a shooting spree, killing 13 people in the town before being gunned down in a shootout with pursuing police. Apparently, all of this started after a verbal altercation with his neighbour about his daughter walking on David's property. So Robin tried to brush it off as he claimed that it allowed the children to heal and or process their grief. Fellow teachers, however, described Robin's actions as follows. He was deeply depressed, to the point of impairing his ability to do his job of teaching children. Robin appeared to be increasingly disorganised and struggling to cope. There were piles of unopened mail on his desk, and his classroom was dishevelled, disorganised and untidy. At the age of 17, Laniette made the decision to leave the family home and live at a boarding house. 
She had spent many of the previous years living away from home, including the family's camper van and also at a schoolhouse with her father. So basically after a, a few months of the uh, the rest of the school employees basically seeing Robin living in a camper van in the car park, they basically had a spare room at the school, well, well it was a spare house by the side of the school that they basically cleared up and it was used for storage and they, they allowed Robin to stay in there and sometimes Laniette would, would come and, and stay with him. But to, to counter the claims that there was any kind of, you know, incestual sexual relationship going on between the two, it was more a case of that family home with Margaret and the rest of the family was very unpleasant to live in. The kids were still very close with their, fa with their father despite Margaret's efforts to paint him as the devil. So you could just view it as Laniette wanting to be with her father, wanting to be in a clean and, and, and happy place. But it's a decision that Laniette's ultimately made to, to get away from the family altogether. But then also people argue that she's left the family home because she wants to get away from this alleged sexual abuse. During this time, Laniette became addicted to drugs and was also earning an income as a sex worker. She also fell into a deep depression, much like her father. So just to recap, as obviously there's lots going on with different members of the Bain family, with the exception of Arawa, the youngest daughter, who was training to be a teacher, and Stephen, the youngest son, who was still in education. So obviously there's so much going on, so many different names, and so many different issues occurring with different family members of the Bain family. We'll do a quick recap on David, Robin, Margaret, and Laniette. So despite the challenges, loneliness and bullying that he faced in his life to this point, David has started to turn his life around. He has remained loyal to his mother despite her making several strange claims about demons being in the family home. He also, as Tom mentioned, got himself a girlfriend. He's continuing with his studies and he is working part time on his paper round. Robin, the father, is in a deep depression. His work is suffering. He is living between a camper van, essentially a schoolhouse classroom, as well as a caravan and he's completely fallen out of love and out of touch with his wife. He's also considered somewhat of an outsider to the rest of his family. And there are also obviously the allegations that we've mentioned about his relationship with Laniette. And Laniette, by this point, is also living away from the family home in a boarding house, but she also obviously spent time briefly at the schoolhouse with Robin, and she's also now allegedly addicted to drugs and working as a sex worker. And Margaret, the mother, is living an equally unhealthy life, very rarely leaving the family home, which is in an almost inhabitable state, proclaiming to friends that she is stone to start her own spiritual retreat, with some friends describing it as a cult, once Robin is out of the picture. Some of these friends have even claimed that Margaret said she would shoot Robin if she could. Very peculiar thing to say. And she's also preaching to her remaining children, David, Arawa, and Stephen, that she can see and feel Belle in the family home, and that she is in direct communication with God. In one of her final diary entries, Margaret even wrote that God would not permit Robin to harm her and would somehow provide the funds for the new house if Robin left the marriage and took us half the matrimonial property. A note to make here as well, because a lot of negativity has been painted on both parents to this point, David allegedly had a very strange and very strange relationship with both his sisters. A lot of his sister's friends said that David was odd, controlling and even threatening, always keeping tight tabs on them when it came to his sisters. They also suggested that he was jealous of both the abilities to make friends and that sometimes his jealousy was predominantly towards male friends and almost came across as if he was some sort of jilted ex-boyfriend of each of the sisters. That is strange behaviour, if it's, uh, well, strange alleged behaviour from David. And with Lanyette, he did have a bit of a strange relationship with Lanyette. It was what very kind of, she would refer to him as my David a lot of the times. And it was just, yeah, it seemed just a bit odd in, in general, that, that relationship there. Multiple friends of Lanyette has since come forward to say that she was very open about being both scared of David and her father Robin, with her stating that she felt both of them were strange and unstable. Others have suggested that Lanyette actually confided to David about what Robin had been doing to her and that he was simply defensive of his two sisters. So here is where everything kind of culminates in the Bain family case. You have a severely depressed father who is potentially also allegedly a sexual abuser. You have a highly paranoid mother who believes that she is in direct communication with God, uh, that demons are in her home and that she has also made verbal threats that she would shoot her husband if she could. You've got an eldest son, David, who has always been close to his mother, but has reportedly held hostile relationships with both of his sisters and also quite a strained relationship with his own father. And then you you have a youngest sister who, according to her close friends, as Tom just mentioned, um, was ready to reveal to the Bain family that their father had been committing acts of incest on her for multiple years. She also claimed that she was terrified of returning to the family home because she believed that David was unstable. And also she told multiple friends that David regularly kept a rifle in his possession. You then have two other siblings that not a great deal of public information is available about, which is Arawa and the youngest son, Stephen. 
David would later state that although he didn't see it at the time, the Bain family dynamic was highly volatile and highly dysfunctional. Yeah, and one thing to note is David was actually very on board with Margaret's beliefs out of the whole family. He was the one that was, you know, he who spent a lot of his time actually trying to prepare the house ready to, to make it into the spiritual re retreat for Margaret. He would listen to her, what her kind of teachings and her preachings on things, and he was very uh, engrossed in what she was saying. So even though Margaret seemed to be very uh, erratic, it seemed that David was very much intertwined with those beliefs and, and those feelings that she had as well. It was dysfunctional, absolutely, and I'm quite happy to admit that now. At the time, I didn't see it as dysfunctional, because that's just the normal thing. I lived in that household, we were a very tight group. I just considered it to be how life was led. I didn't see us as being out of the ordinary. So at this point, a sudden Bain family meeting is called at the family home by David, which apparently would be a regular occurrence. It didn't strike anyone as odd, as apparently Margaret would regularly meet her children to discuss knocking down the family home and building a sanctuary in its place. So there would be building plans where each person's bedroom would be, where different rooms would be, and how each person would be involved and help with the building of the new retreat. So when this particular meeting is called, it was uh, on a Friday that they start then to make their way towards the property to spend the weekend there. But only one of these family members would make it through to the following week. And it is here that we move to the timeline of the Bain family murders. So a small precursor to mention here in the timeline is that the only living testimony that we still have is David's. And obviously people can choose to agree or disagree with his personal timeline of events and descriptions of what occurred. But we have also then gone by official court documents, the beliefs of forensic investigators, as well as local police, as well as witnesses and medical professional testimony. One argument is that whether the family meeting even happened or not, uh, you know, is that still a question without an answer and whether the meeting was ever called in the first place place or not can also still be called into question. The only reason we know a family meeting would have been called is that allegedly Laniette told her friends that she was going back to the family uh, home for a family meeting that had been called and there are reasons why this meeting was going to happen which we'll explain in our timeline. So what we're going to do is go by David's narrative and then we'll pick that apart with what the prosecution believed to happen um, and I'm interested to see what Dan thinks about this Tom because I'm going to try not to be too biased with my beliefs, but I, I feel like Dan's going to have the same opinion as us. Uh, and I feel like we have the same opinion, but we might not. Obviously, we've covered the staircase, uh, Michael Peterson case a few episodes ago. And that one, we sort of, our opinions changed almost all the time. And a lot of people's opinions on the case changed as well. With this, I made my mind up very, very early and it has not changed once. I don't know if that was the same for you, Tom. Yeah, I think a lot of precursor on a lot of things I listened to had they all kind of stipulate at the very beginning that they think this case is shut and there's not many people that strongly think different to what we think okay. really when you listen to other like podcasts about it or you watch a lot of content about it it seems a bit far-fetched the, uh, the other alternative that's why it's such a crazy case and what was to actually actually occur yeah it'd be interesting thing what Dan, Dan thinks but I'd be surprised if he thinks any different to us yeah Monday the 20th of June 1994 around 5 a.m. David Bain's alarm goes off early in the morning in order for him to go on his paper round. The route was a familiar one for David, who would get into his running gear, pop his headphones on, strap a yellow newspaper bag over his shoulder and take the family dog, Casey. David had been running the round over the last several months and timing each round he did, hoping to eventually bring his average time down. Never heard of a paper man running it. Two birds, one stone if you're, if you're trying to get fit and improve your speed and also get a bit of money doing it. But you're right, I, I've, I don't Yeah, I wasn't really questioning the fact that yeah. it exercise. Like, so I was just saying I've never um, been done before. But um, yeah. some neighbours recall being woken up by the sound of David running or his dog barking at houses where other dogs were living in recent weeks, but none did so on this particular morning. Yeah, that would, if I had a, an early paper delivery and the dog would bark at my house, I wouldn't be a big fan of that. No, basically because this happening and him bringing the dogs on it, there was a particular person on this paper route where they basically said, don't take the uh, delivery straight to the door, leave it at a certain spot so that you don't set my dogs off barking, which David did adhere to and he respected that. But on this particular morning, which was very odd, was he actually made sure he did go up to the steps and the dogs did bark. So the one time he did it in like weeks, so as if he was maybe leaving some trail to be able to like place himself at certain places at certain times, who knows? But that's the thing he did this morning, which was very different to what he was doing previously. A nice little barking alibi. Or howling. It would work if it was a different metaphor and if it made many sense as a metaphor. 
Oh, just a, yeah, it's not, not really, just, just a barking alibi. Covered by the, the bark. What do you think, Dan? <laughs> I think you should crack on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, Though some neighbours stated they believed the newspapers arrived up to two hours early on this particular morning. And one neighbour said that they saw David, but that he wasn't with a dog and he wasn't carrying his yellow paper bag. 6.43am. Having returned from his morning paper round, David enters the family home via the front door and notices that his mother's bedroom light is on. He disregards this, even though she does not usually wake up before midday, and he heads to his bedroom without turning any lights on. So yeah, it's completely pitch black at this point. It's a winter morning, and yeah, he's opted not to turn any lights on. David then took off his paper bag and hung it up, placed his Walkman onto his bed before removing his running clothes and heading downstairs to the bathroom to wash the black ink from the newspapers from his hands. He then places his dirty clothes into the washing machine and changes into a fresh outfit. Knowing that his father Robin typically woke up around this time and that he would routinely head from the caravan at the bottom of the garden to the living room in the house in order to say his morning prayer, David then decided to go back upstairs. Once upstairs, he returned to his bedroom where he then turned on the lights and immediately noticed several bullets as well as a disregarded trigger lock on the floor of his room. Panicked, he then went to his mother Margaret's room where he found her dead in her bed with a gunshot rune to her head. That does rhyme annoyingly well. Yo! Panicked, David then went to his mother Margaret's room where he witnessed her dead in the bed, um, having received a... Oh, fuck's sake. Panicked, David then went to his mother Margaret's room where he found her dead in her bed um, with signs of gunshot wounds to her head. Nope, you did the wrong bit. You put the head at the end of it. Shit. What to say? What say? <laughs> what say? <laughs> Panicked, he then went to his mother Margaret's room where he found her deceased in her bed, with her head having a clear gunshot wound. David then rushes between his siblings' bedrooms to find all of them deceased with gunshot wounds to the head. The youngest daughter, Laniette, appears to have at least three bullet wounds to the head, but is still, according to David, gurgling. David then heads to the living room where he finds his father dead on the floor also as a result of a gunshot wound to the head, with ominously David's 22 caliber Winchester semi-automatic rifle lying next to him. A minute later, David then observes the family computer in the lounge, stating the following cryptic message. Sorry, you are the only one who deserved to stay. The reason that we mentioned it was literally a minute later is because it could be evidence that this particular computer was switched on at approximately 6.44 a.m. There are also reports that David was seen at the front gate of the family home at 6.45 a.m. and that multiple neighbors were woken up by a barking dog at around 7 a.m. At the time of their murders, Robin was 58, Margaret was 50, Arrowa was 19, Laniette was 18, and Stephen was just 14. David, meanwhile, was 22 at the time. And another thing to mention is that this, although we've gone through this version of events, that was what David would later tell uh, investigators. Although arriving police, he only said that he's found his mum and his dad dead. So we'll, we'll, we'll explain that a bit more shortly. 7.09 a.m. After spending at least 15 to 25 minutes, although some estimate it to have been 19 minutes, in what David described as a spaced out trance-like state of shock, and also in, in this time not returning to see his gurgling sister, David makes the following call to 111, which is the emergency service number in New Zealand. And we'll, we'll play this for you now. This can help you. No. They're all dead. What's the matter? They're all dead. Oh, I came home and they're all dead. Whereabouts are you? Um, um, every street. Or every street. 65 every street. They're all dead. Who's all dead? My, my family, they're all dead. Hurry up. It's okay. Every street. It runs off, off Somerville Street. Yes. What number are you calling from? Four. Four five four. Mm -hmm. Two five two seven. Four five four. Two five two seven. Two five two seven. And your last name? Bain. Bain. Okay. We're on our way. Okay, Mr. Bain. It will be there very shortly. And yeah, the interesting thing to note here is that David straight away is saying, my family, they're all dead, they're all dead, my family are dead, when he would only tell police officers that he'd seen his mother and father. But I suppose you could argue that's still family. Well, it is family. But my whole family, they're all dead, they're all dead. 
there's a, a little bit of a uh, suspiciousness um, to that there because, yeah, his story would change a lot from this point onwards. There is a particular couple of seconds within this 111 call that has been micro-analysed and even reported on the mainstream media in New Zealand. It's kind of a point of the call where David seems to be uh, hyperventilating. And whilst he is uh, hyperventilating, David can be heard saying either, I shot the prick or I can't breathe. It's kind of like that whole um, Yanni or Laurel auditory illusion thing, I thought. I you can, I if you're breathe. reading it both, you can hear both. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, that is all. I mean, one thing with that call is how chilled out the guys on the phone to him is, is quite staggering. He's just like, okay, oh, okay. It just very like, he might have thought David maybe was having an episode and it was more of a, um, you know, he had imagined this thing to happen. Obviously in a very kind of quiet neighborhood. But yeah, it, it, it's a very interesting call. And I think, yeah, a lot of people take a lot of different things from that call. Yeah, the one that I hear most often or see most often is that they, they say that it sounds overacted. But we have that with every call, I swear. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to be fair, there are all cases when people say that it's cases where people speculate whether or not the person did it. So I guess I can understand that. But it's always like, I'm sure if you listen to actual innocent people calling it as well, they're going to sound very animated when they make the phone call. So yeah, it's, it's always a bit of a hard one to judge. It's okay. I know what you mean, Tom, about how like, if, you, if you're applying a blame on someone, you can always twist it in a certain way, can't you? But... Again, that does sound a bit like in the whole Michael yeah. Peterson vibe to it's me. It's very similar to that call I was just about what? to say. What? Yeah. How, <laughs> how many steps? <laughs> as well, how helpful is it? Where do you live? Every street. No, where do you live specifically? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it does sound very, considering he's got a acting background and a musical theatre background, it's not as mm. A, mm. well played out as possibly could be. But yeah, I mean, well, let us know in the comments below uh, what you guys think of that call. Did that immediately point to David being suspicious? We'd like to hear what you guys have to say on that. 7.33 a.m., approximately 24 minutes after the initial call from David, local police arrive at 65 Every Street, where they are met with sound of dogs frantically barking. They are not able to initially identify any people within the property, so they make their way towards the front door. They notice a highly distressed David Bain through a bedroom window, and though he was shouting, they're all dead, they're all dead, he would not open the front door for them. The officers open it themselves, where they are greeted by a scene of absolute chaos. They note that the house shows signs of multiple struggles, that all the family members were clearly deceased, but that the youngest family member, Stephen, had undoubtedly put up a fight. They went through the house and they found all the family members, but Stephen was the last family member they found. It's quite a thing apparently in New Zealand with having like, kind of like a curtain between some rooms at, at times so it's kind of like a hidden room but they basically went and they found all the family members apart from Stephen and then eventually they went through this curtain and they found him on the floor and yeah, it was very clear they had put up a fight. They made their way between different rooms where they eventually find David cradled in the fetal position hyperventilating and allegedly repeatedly chanting black hands black hands coming to take them away which is the name of the uh, kind of infamous uh, the podcast series on this, Black Hands, which is very a very detailed one, which is, I think, over 10 episodes. David does say some interesting things. So David, who was acting very frantic at this point, uh, went on to have a seizure, or so people believed, but um, with the people there actually did some tests whilst he was doing it and think he was putting the seizure on. But anyway, they called the ambulance. There is footage of David being wheeled away from the house by paramedics in front of a gathering crowd. He was taken to hospital and later interviewed by police. Initially, David is considered a witness, and the intruder theory is a predominant focus, but suspicions gradually arise during the investigation. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sort of hearsay in this this case as well. There's um, a lot of kind of, well, Laniette's friend said this, uh, Robin's colleague said that. There was also apparently one of David's friends that stated David had made a, a really odd remark um, shortly before the family murders, saying that there was a female jogger he'd seen uh, whilst he was out jogging, and that he allegedly made some sort of off-colour remark that if he got that female jogger, alone that he would assault her sexually assault her um, but this was suppressed from ever being allowed to um, be part of the evidence against david for for some reason but yeah i just found that interesting and tom mentioned black hands podcast there's also black hands a mini series that was created about this that had david's uncle as an as a producer on the show and it's um a really they recreate this scene uh, very harrowingly it's um really well cast as well but there are arguments about how accurate it is and that maybe there was some bias towards defending robin in that in that case so before going into the prosecution theory of events here are some of the interesting pieces of evidence and observations made at the scene of the murders number one david's bloody fingerprints were found on the murder weapon but a, a lot later on dna uh, evidence proved that it wasn't actually human blood that was, but it was david's fingerprints 
Number two, David had fresh injuries to his forearm, hands, arms, chest and knee that could have been considered defensive wounds, but there was no explanation for them and the nature of them potentially indicated that it was David who had the fight with Stephen. Number three, droplets of blood were found on David's socks, as well as blood which has caused the luminal observed part sock prints in other parts of the house. So the, the argument around sock prints is that they leave inconsistent prints, and a lot of people believe that these sock prints were actually much closer to Robin's size than David's size. So there were bloody sock prints, and people believe now that that suggests Robin was walking around, um, but they make very inconsistent prints, so it's hard to it's hard to actually prove which one of them it was. Number four, the rifle and ammunition were David's, and the key to the trigger lock was typically kept in an unusual place where he had hidden it. Number five, David's blood-stained white opera gloves were found under a bed in Stephen's room. Yeah, he had these gloves for an event or a, a dance or something he went to, um, and I believe that they were worn throughout this, um, throughout the massacre. Number six, blood found on top of the washing machine powder container to include David's bloody palm print, porcelain basin, and various lights which must have come from David's touch. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of things obviously from this is pointing towards David being very much involved, not just finding the bodies. And he didn't even state that, you know, he went around, he, you know, he didn't say that he touched the family member when he found them on the floor or anything like that. So it's very, very peculiar. Yeah, he, he would argue that because when he returned from his paper round, he didn't turn any of the lights on. He would say that, well, when I was putting my clothes in the washing machine, I could easily have picked up a blood soaked item of clothing and therefore transferred blood all over the house. But surely you would kind of feel that on your hands yeah, or in definitely. the clothing. Number seven, bloodstained clothing, including a green jersey with fibres matching those found under Stephen's fingernails, was washed by David, and his sweatshirt with blood on his shoulder had been sponged. Stephen was strangled by his own t-shirt, but signs that he fought back are clear. Number eight, David wore glasses as he had visual impairment. The glasses with one missing lens and fitted David's general glass prescription was found in the chair near where he was in the room where the police arrived. The left side of the frame was damaged and the missing lens was found later in Stephen's room quite near his body. So yeah, on this it was, yeah, it was the loose lens was found in Stephen's room, but apparently people will argue, or specifically people that defend David will argue that this lens actually was under a few items of clothing and also had dust on it to suggest that it had been there for a long time. It's not looking great for David at this point, I would say, with all these observations. Number nine, if David had truly heard Lanyat making gurgling noises, then she must have been alive and consequently he had been by her bed when the last shot was fired. Why did he not do anything in order to try and save her life at that point? Uh, number 10, Stephen's fingerprints are found on the silence of the rifle, indicating that he tried to fight off his attacker. There's also bruising to Stephen's neck consistent with strangulation. Could this be where the lens of David's glasses was knocked out? And number 11, it is probable that the delay in between finding his family members deceased and making the call to 111 could have been caused by David trying to wash his clothes of their blood. There would be arguments to each observation here in terms of, well, you, you know, the blood was there because he touched something that already had blood on it. His own glasses were in the shop, so he actually would have had to wear his mother's glasses, the dust on the lens. We're going to go into a bit more um, observations made that make Robin look slightly more of a guilty party in this case. But yeah, I mean, what, what are your initial thoughts there? Because I think that is, that's, that's a, a significant amount of evidence against David. Yeah, it, uh, it looks, looks damning against David so far. It's um, hard to see otherwise right now. Yeah, I, th I even think from some of the behaviours that David has, has displayed and Robin's displayed, I think we'll get into it with Lanyette and, and her allegations against Robin, but that's been very disputed in terms of the sexual abuse. And Lanyette was known to kind of say a lot of things for attention to her teachers and about being raped and then kind of like backtracking tracking on things. And then she claimed by uh, uh, once trying to take a life. And, the, and then that was kind of proved to be incorrect as well. So I kind of think she was acting out a little bit by these, some of these claims, it appears to be. So I think Robin, just so far as I said, seems to be hard, you know, he's a hardworking guy trying to provide for his family, trying to live the best he can within this very like difficult family dynamic. Mm. David, yeah, as, as Ben mentioned, he's, he's been known to be very controlling with his with, you know, ex-girlfriends. He would always want to know where they are, being very kind of, Odd with his behaviour, he uh, allegedly said to someone that he had, he had a rape fantasy. It's just a lot of kind of red flags around David. He's not the biggest guy either, so the the idea of murdering someone in their sleep wouldn't be too outlandish for him. But then also, if he had woken Stephen, the youngest brother, up, and there was a bit of a fight, David's covered in like there's scratches to his forehead, chest, arms, hands. It looks like there was a great struggle there. So. Whereas you'd think if it was Robin, perhaps Robin would have those, if Stephen had defended himself so much, maybe Robin would have some marks, whereas we'll, we'll go into it. Robin only had 
uh, a few cuts in in interesting places that would also have an alibi for so yeah it's really not looking great for david at this point so regardless of the above david remains considered as a victim rather than a suspect and almost immediately kind of the idea of any kind of intruder theory is disregarded and attention now turns to robin as the potential perpetrator of the crimes due to uh, well predominantly due to uh, several of laniette's friends as well as david suggesting that she had informed them that the pair had been engaging in an incestuous relationship so yeah there were murmurs coming out now um from friends of of the family members that Robin maybe wasn't quite as clean cut as the image he had presented and again it depends what your opinion is of this case um, but there were also um, several kind of observations made uh, regarding Robin so just as we did with uh, with David we're going to go through these for Robin again it's whether or not this family meeting was ever called in the first place or whether it actually happened and if that was all, all in all the plan to get everyone within the same building for either Robin or David to do this. So number one, Robin had at least six cuts on his hands and wrists, with a photo showing clear cuts to his finger that many people believe could have been caused by reloading the rifle. Robin's brother and uh, David's uncle Michael argued that these cuts were caused by Robin having recently built a nature reserve for children at his school in the days prior to the murders. Number two, nobody else's blood apart from his own was found on Robin. Number three, none of Robin's fingerprints could be found on the murder weapon, the rifle that was lying next to his body, as well as the morning newspaper. Um, so basically Robin had brought the, he was going to do his morning prayer. He'd also brought with him the morning's newspaper, which I don't know if David had delivered or brought back with him or not. So the argument there is why would he have brought the morning newspaper in with him to then go and commit familicide um, before taking his own life? So yeah, that's a, a curious one. Number four, there was no blood whatsoever on Robin's socks. So the argument about the, the, the bloody sock prints walking through the house that they looked a bit more like Robin's size shoe rather than David, well, there was no blood whatsoever on Robin's socks. And this contradicted the theory that he could have been walking between different rooms of the house where the bloody sock prints were found. Number five, and this is, yeah, this is a big one, no gunpowder traces were found on Robin's hands. Number six, if Robin had been the wearer of the blood-stained clothing and was intent on suicide, why would he have bothered to change his clothes and be in completely blood-free clothes when he shot himself? Another note to make on the idea that Robin killed his family before killing himself is that the post-mortem on Robin's body showed that he had a full bladder. So again, yeah, many have suggested that there's no possible way he could have committed all of these acts on a full bladder, as full as it was anyway. I don't know the intricate details around bladders being completely full. Uh, number seven, the angle of the bullet entry to Robin's head, as well as the length of the rifle with a silencer on it, made the possibility of suicide almost completely impossible. Bladder. Thank you. Bladder. Did I say it wrong? I just thought you'd like to, like to hear it. Oh, cheers. Bladder. Yeah, so we saw similarities with the White House farm case. Basically, the, the suggestion was the angle of the bullet entry to Robin, as well as the length it would have taken for not only just a rifle, but a rifle with then um, sort of almost a foot long silencer on the end of it, made it very, very difficult for him to, to have been able to do that. And then finally, number eight, if Robin was responsible, what was the logical reason for the message left on the computer? Would it not have been more appropriate for Robin to leave a handwritten message so that the responsibility could not be placed Placed on his son. Again, there, there are uh, question marks around the relationship between Robin and David and whether they saw eye to eye, but there are other claims that Robin had actually recently paid off his daughter's debt and also called the school to say that he wouldn't be in the following Monday, uh, so he'd essentially called in sick. Yeah, there are allegations both ways, but for me, having gone through that, and I know there'll be some people still adamant that David is innocent. From those observations there, the, the element of guilt could be much easier placed at David rather than Robin. And I still don't understand how an intruder was, was kind of uh, ruled out so early on. I still don't understand that, but it's, yeah, th that's kind of the list of the two there. 
And another thing to, to mention regarding the observations made against David is that in his bedroom on his bedside, there was a collection of short stories by Agatha Christie. And the last of five was called Death Comes as an End, which was basically the tale of a son who kills his family to claim the inheritance. And that's what many people believe was his kind of motive in this case. The house was falling apart. He wasn't very happy living there. He wasn't very happy with the relationships he held with the rest of his family. And he also realized that if he was to do this particular act, he would be uh, the only one left in line for a large piece of inheritance. They also, I think, had land, uh, a bunch of land in Australia, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. They, even though they had the real messy house and they looked like they were living week, uh, month on month, they did have actually property in other places which would come to quite a fair about amount of money. So even though they looked like they were struggling, they actually did have money in the back pocket. June 24th, 1994, four days after the murders, after the Bain family funeral was held, and David by this point had been interviewed by police on three separate occasions, he is formally arrested on suspicion of murdering five members of his family. The prosecution argued that David killed all his family in order to get the inheritance. They theorised that David woke up around 5am, put on a pair of white opera gloves as well as his mother's reading glasses, before retrieving his rifle and placing his silencer on it. He then first goes into Laniette's room, where he shoots her in the head twice. He goes to his mother's room where he shoots her once at point black range in the forehead. He then goes to Stephen's room where he attempts to do the same, but as he is placing the rifle against his forehead, Stephen wakes up and a struggle ensues. This results in the glasses being knocked off David's face and causing several scratch marks, whilst he strangles his younger brother before shooting him in the head. The one thing I find with this case, because I, I'm, I mean, not a big surprise for anyone, I am obviously in the David camp of believing he did it. The relationship he had with his mother, which was close, I find it surprising there wasn't enough signs there for make me go like why he would do it really part of inheritance but it's not like he lives a lavish lifestyle or showed any real signs of like wanting more from life he was he was very much set on making this uh safe haven with his mum like this retreat was part of the big thing he would do it and in all his spare yeah. time he'd be working on the house and all this stuff so it just feels a bit yeah, that's one bit that I find a bit jarring with that. The only thing I would say is probably of all the victims, his mother was probably the one that he allegedly killed in the most humane way. That's true. But I, I still, yeah, I still see what you're saying. Uh, there's been theories where it's, it's the folie de like puff of madness between him and the mum, like it was kind of a shared psychosis between them as well. David then goes downstairs to find his sister Aroa, awake and praying for her life. He fires one shot at her, but as his vision is impaired by the damage to his glasses, the bullet misses. He then fires another which goes straight through her forehead, killing her. He then returns upstairs to find Laniette, who has been shot twice in the head, gurgling. He then shoots a third and final shot into her head. David then places all the clothes into the washing machine and changes into his running clothes before taking his dog on his paper round with him. David returns to his house roughly 70 minutes later, where he then turns on the computer and types out the cryptic message, before hiding behind the green curtains in the living room. Here he waits for his father to come in from the caravan in the garden to pray, and when he does, he shoots him in the head killing him, before placing the rifle at his side and calling 111 immediately. So that kind of backs up the idea, like I was saying earlier, him being on the paper round, wanting to be seen and heard as an alibi for what happened. Yeah, I this I find this uh, timeline of events, the, the prosecution's theory, much more plausible than David's. There's a less time unaccounted for in this one, and and the Laniette part kind of lines up a bit more, but yeah, that's absolutely horrendous. The computer element, the cryptic message on the uh, computer having been typed out that specific minute, apparently it took more than a minute for the computer to boot up anyway, and obviously if he'd handwritten anything, it could have been fucking hell. If he'd had, and if he'd, and if <laughs> sorry, <laughs> fucking mental, isn't it? <laughs> It's like Austin Powers taking a piss. Ooh, that, Whoa. That sounds like a dog with three heads. <laughs> and then deathly silence. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> three shots. And yeah, I think I don't think the, the him typing this out on the computer was planned. I think it was maybe a last minute thought to cover his tracks and you know, anything handwritten could have obviously been traced back to him. Did they fingerprint the keyboard? I think obviously with that as well, it's difficult because if it's a family computer. Yeah, it's true. It's probably smothered. So during the opening of the trial, Judge Justice Neil Williamson had this to say. It has never been suggested that anyone other than either Robin or David was responsible for these killings or that the culprit, whoever it was, was not responsible for all of them. Thus, leaving the burden of proof aside, 
the question has always been, as the judge put it in the opening line of his summing up, who did it? David Bain? Robin Bain? The first bit sounds like, I don't anyone other than what I've been. <laughs> Gavin DeGraw? <laughs> Robin or David? Just two weeks after the murders, a huge moment occurs in the Bain family case, when at the request of the remaining Bain family, the home is burnt down by local firefighters. Yeah, so who knew you could actually hire local firefighters to burn your house down as well as um, to save it? <laughs> Double threat. And a very odd thing. I think, hasn't that been another case as well that we've covered where a fire happens soon after it? Or am I just... I know the White House farm one, didn't they get rid of a load of evidence, like burn a load of evidence before they had a proper chance, like carpets and bits like that. I'm sure they did something to the scene. I felt like that was one we covered not too long ago, but I can't remember what it is. That suggests that literally David and Robin have requested the home to be burnt down. Or is, that a, is there a bigger? Not Robin, because Robin's dead. So it's just David? Well, David gave the ultimate go-ahead, but there were, yeah, there were other family members that were consulted. I think they also were... The locals were saying, number one, also, it's kind of a stain on the community. But number two, it's not safe. The building's semi-derelict. It's going to collapse. But surely that is, if you're David, you want that crime scene reserved for as long as possible. In the process, destroying any remaining evidence, including DNA and trace evidence, this would be a decision that would come back to haunt David and cause further criticisms of the case. Well, if it comes back to haunt him or it helps him, haunt or hinder. I, I just, yeah, this is huge, and I, I don't understand the thought process behind it uh, from anyone giving the go-ahead on this. Surely you'd want to, because all they then have is photos and statements. That's it. I, yeah, I just find that very, very bizarre. Mm. So we then move to May of 1995, 11 months after the murders of his family, the trial of David Bain begins at, what is it, Dunedin? Bladder. Dunedin? So we then move to May of 1995, which is 11 months after the murders of the Bain family. And this is where the trial of David Bain begins at Dunedin High Court. The key evidence and observations that we have just discussed were put forward by both the defence and prosecution, whilst David's theory of events was argued by the defence against the prosecution's theory of events. During the trial, over 60 witnesses were called to give testimony and more than 20 additional written statements were read by consent. A man named Dean Cottle, who, um, yeah, this is another big moment of this case, uh, he was a good friend of Laniette's, was expected to testify on behalf of the defence to suggest that Laniette was intending to expose an incestuous relationship between her and her father. But Dean Cottle failed to show up at court when he was called. Cottle then subsequently did submit a written statement, but as he'd already not shown up when he was called, the judge dismissed it as he now deemed Cottle to be an unreliable witness. And even then, it's kind of, yes, it's a witness statement, but it's yeah, he's one of the very few people that could back up Laniette's claims here. Well, it's still, it's still as we said earlier on, like Laniette is one who spun the yarn occasionally and would say things, whether for attention, and her telling a story to him... It's not physical evidence, is it, either way, in terms of of that. The trial lasted for three weeks before a verdict was eventually reached. During this time, no outright motive was discussed for either David or Robin to have committed the murders, which, yet again, is extremely rare in any murder trial. It was more a case of which one of them, in your belief, is more likely to have done this. And again, that just, for me, I I know the Bain family didn't have any enemies that people were aware of although and there's certainly no financial motive to go in that house and and, and rob every anything from that house but yeah i don't understand how the intruder theory was just brushed away so quickly so judge williamson who we mentioned earlier would go on to make the following remark about no motive being discussed it is beyond comprehension we can't understand it your job is to work out who did it not to worry about why it happened we will probably never know why These events were so bizarre and abnormal that it was impossible for the human mind to conceive of any logical or reasonable explanation. On the 29th of May 1995, David Bain was found guilty of five counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a 16-year minimum non-parole period. Over the next 12 years, now this is the part where uh, there are numerous appeals that are launched and uh, a a particular individual that becomes involved in the case uh, that will take it on a, a number of different twists and turns. Over this period of time, David maintains his innocence, leading to numerous appeals and a petition for a royal pardon, with many people believing that David was scapegoated due to him having long hair and an awkward demeanour. Boys with long hair in schools and universities across New Zealand even began selling jars of jam in order to raise funds and spread awareness for David's appeal. Spread awareness. 
The case continues to gain public attention, including that of famous rugby player Joe Karam. So yeah, Joe Karam becoming involved in this case is a, yeah, a significant moment. Uh, rugby is a huge thing over in New Zealand and he was a very, very famous player, national hero. And uh, he basically came across these students that were selling jars of jam uh, where he first heard of the case. So these students obviously shared David's story with Joe, made him aware of all the different issues regarding the, the trial itself and the lack of evidence, um, the fact that he wasn't proven, in their opinion, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And yeah, he became obsessed uh, with, with this case, obsessed with David's story. And uh, he, without Joe becoming involved in this case, I don't think the same outcome would, would ever have happened. And yeah, he engages in debates regarding the reliability of evidence and any kind of motive of David's guilt. Joe Karam, by this point, when he got involved in the case, was a multimillionaire. He owned 20 different properties all around the world, all of which he sold in order to fund legal expenses to fight for David's cause. And he also spent up to $4 million of his own money to fund David's appeals. The first appeal was rejected in late 1995, with the second being rejected in 2000. One of the big arguments here was about the mishandling of the crime scene and lack of motive, including obviously, as we mentioned, burning down the house and destroying any remaining DNA evidence, which again- Burning down the house. Yeah, that's too prompt. Give it give it a couple of years, then burn it down, mm. but not a couple of, was it weeks or months by this point? It's, I don't know how David had, would have any say in it. I mean, it's all happening very fast, but surely he's now the kind of custodian or the... the yeah, but if you're if you're under investigation for a murder that happened in the house, you can't go, really yeah, I own it. Yeah, but surely you could say, no, there's evidence, DNA evidence in that house that will prove me innocent. Please don't burn it down. Please don't fucking burn my house down. Yeah, he could say that, but I'm saying that he probably... I think he probably would have wanted it to burn down. True. Mm. Depends if you believe he's innocent or not. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So a notable moment of this case is when in 2007, Karam decided to travel to London, England with David's legal team in order to argue before a privy council. Now this is, yeah, where the, the appeals have now escalated to this point. The team then present to the Privy Council nine points which outline why a retrial should be ordered as well as they continue to push David's innocence. Many of these points made Robin out to be the villain and the responsible party. As a result of this, David was released from prison on bail to prepare for a retrial. And why is England involved in it? So the Privy Council essentially is an advisory board to the, the monarch and it was a mechanism in which if uh, people feel certain uh, legal or council issues um, are ineffective or made under made under dubious circumstances, then this Privy Council can advise um, the monarch on giving a formal effect on the issue. So it's escalated a massive point here and this is why they've now travelled to London to make their claims to the Privy Council. So a retrial was eventually ordered, which started in March of 2009. The trial lasted an agonising three months. However, it only took the jury less than a day to overturn the verdict and find David not guilty on all five counts. Some jury members even allegedly hugged David when the verdict was announced, which is... Over yeah. the following six years, numerous reports and lawsuits were launched regarding the level of compensation David should receive, including the Ian Binney and Ian Callahan reports with David eventually and reluctantly being granted $925,000 in an ex gratia payment with it being agreed that no further legal action would be able to be considered. So he's been released and also given almost a million dollars. There was another individual, another uh, New Zealand native, Arthur Allen Thomas, who had gone through a very similar uh, situation before David did. And in 1970, he was sentenced to a life sentence for the murders of a husband and wife. And this Arthur Allen Thomas served nine years uh, for allegedly murdering this husband and wife uh, and received $950,000 upon his release. And he also then became involved in the Bain case and pled for him to be released as he felt that he had been um, treated in the same regard as he had. So yeah, there's a couple of big, almost million dollar payouts there for, for each case. So that was the timeline for the Bain family murders. We're now going to move on to a bit of aftermath. So at the time of recording, David Bain is approaching his 52nd birthday and has since changed his name to William David Cullen Davies, taking the surname of his wife Liz in a deed poll process. The couple have a son together and are believed to be living somewhere in Australia, having sold their respective properties in Christchurch and Auckland. But at this point in time, many people believe he is still unemployed and is living off the remains of that ex-gratia payment. 
Tom always finds this stuff fascinating, the Bain family home, obviously, well, what remained of it. It's burnt, yeah, it's burnt, right? But a house was rebuilt on the on the development, which is a, it's a massive piece of property on 65 Everest Street in Anderson's Bay, and it was listed on, well, the new home was listed on numerous real estate websites in 2019 for $440,000, uh, about 212,000 pounds, with a sale deadline of August 2019. And New Zealand news outlet Stuff, who have made uh, tons of uh, articles about this particular case, made the following remarks about the listing. The real estate advertisement talks of the Dunedin property's tranquil views, sunny aspect, woodland garden and private patios. The property has another notable feature. It was also the scene of New Zealand's most sensational and controversial murders. The original Bain family house was burnt down, obviously three weeks after the murders, and the new house was built on the grounds in 1996 by Lorraine and Stuart Harvey. And interestingly, the Harveys actually used to live across the road from the Baines before the murders. Basically, Lorraine then moved into this property, but Stuart passed away in 2017, and she basically stated that the house was too big for her to live in alone, so went on to sell it. The current occupiers wish to remain unnamed. In 2020, the miniseries Black Hands was released and Michael Bain, Robin's brother and David's uncle, served as an assistant producer to tell an authentic story. It currently holds pretty good reviews across the board uh, and when Michael was asked of his beliefs on the case, he has never given an outright view. He is reported as saying that he visited David regularly whilst he was in prison and that David remained adamant that he was innocent of the murders. However, he also notes that there is no evidence of grief, remorse or even an apology from David. And he was also angry at David for allowing allegations of incest between Robin and Laniette to go unchallenged. I did start it, um, the Black Hands series, and I know, Tom, you've checked out the Black Hands podcast, and I think that they, they've done a really good job. I think it, it does make you very sympathetic towards Robin. The actor that plays Robin is, is amazing. Yeah, it's an interesting watch. And actually, I found the full thing, the full four hours of it. Currently, someone's been a bit naughty and popped it on YouTube, so it might still be out there um, at the time of recording. Just search Black Hands. So, Michael, regarding these claims that Laniette made and David allowing them to go through into the trial, says that these particular claims are absolutely unjustified and were a complete fantasy in Laniette's mind. Michael also said that at one of these prison visits with David, he suggested to him that if Laniette had been telling lies about the alleged baby and the alleged rapes that she experienced in Papua New Guinea, that it was possible she was also telling lies about the alleged incest. He said that when he suggested this, David refused to discuss the issue. And yeah, the whole thing about Black Hands, obviously it's the name of the miniseries, it's the name of a, a, a quite a long-running podcast about the case. There are two possible meanings from this, number one being the ink from the newspapers on David's paper round that he was allegedly washing from his hands with all the lights out, and number two being Black Hands, Black Hands coming to take them away, which allegedly David was frantically chanting when the police arrived. And yeah, as I said, the, the podcast is out there. The full uh, miniseries is available on YouTube at the moment. Um, there's about four hours long. I don't know how, uh, obviously it's cheeky that someone's uploaded it. I don't know, would it make it even more cheeky if I popped it in our Facebook group? Yeah. It's very cheeky, isn't it? I mean, they can just search it and find it. Yeah. So yeah, but the question I mentioned earlier on to you guys is kind of a big overarching question. It's not completely from this case. So with Joe Cram being such a big character, obviously um, being a kind of hero in New Zealand and being very charismatic, it made me think about certain lawyers and you know the, how they tell stories and how they use certain language and to display evidence. With the kind of prevalence of AI, do you think if they were put for a filter, or basically it's just used the same kind of language for the defence and for the prosecution, and it was kind of not said with any emotion. It was just said as bare facts or facts from either side. Then the jury are having a lot more, they're not being led down the garden path by someone or like being made to feel a certain way because of the language used. It's more of just over here's the cold hard evidence from one side and here's the prosecution from the other side. Because a lot of it does just, just depend on if you have a really good lawyer who tells a story better than the other person. Wow, yeah. I, yeah, because that completely removes kind of your emotional investment. I think, yeah, I think that would obviously force you, but then maybe you'd have a view on the the kind of the physical body language, the appearance of the suspect. Maybe that would influence you slightly yeah, more. Yeah, but that's fine to have them in the room and even be them yeah. being questioned. The question read up by AI kind of thing, or if you type it for a thing, so it's not someone go... I just think there's a lot of emotion in quorums, and rightly so, I'm not saying that, but I just thought that with the kind of displaying of evidence in certain ways, you can... Yeah. It's, just, it's, just, it's like... 
you know if if there's someone talk i don't know it's, yeah it's funny you say you say that tom because we started watching um the staircase again Ooh. just because just to have a fresh look at it and it is funny how i mean it sounds obvious but the prosecution wants to win and the defendant wants to win so they'll do anything to make that happen and i and i remember chatting to Sophie about it that it's um you know when they pick particular people to go on the stand as well depending on what side they are they can get quite defensive and quite mm. they can get quite biased and i do find that it's quite frustrating to watch in a courtroom to it's it's always so heavily weighted and not encouraged to be as impartial as possible with yeah. the case so yeah basically what i'm saying is it you know that that could be quite a useful tool to like you say to bring out the the hard cold facts and make sure it's not too heavily weighted in either way and even having if someone has there should be a case of if the defense have a certain expert that expert should be given to the prosecution as well yeah you're not from one side of the court it, that expert is used by both parties mm. yeah but they just say the one point rather than heavily having experts basically saying just fitting things to the evidence exactly. but yeah i don't know that's just a it was just the one thing i was thinking like i mean it'd be fucking boring to sit for a <laughs> court case for four months and having someone and then this happened and then this happened it'd be fucking torture but yeah there's so much that can influence it as well because there's there's some it's not something i went out of my way to watch but there's another thing on netflix that is good for background and i know a lot of people pop, pop us on in the background which is fine but uh, it's called a hundred humans and they do basically te- there's all different age groups different races and people from different walks of life and they do lots of different studies to prove things based on gender assumptions based on racial assumptions based on ageism and one of the experiments they do is a mugshot one and they basically have actors come in that are um, also models and have like a pleasant looking mugshot taken. Then they have people that are also actors, but they pull like a slightly more aggressive face towards towards their mugshot. They do do um, different people from different races and then they poll people based on what length of scent they give. Each set of photos get given the exact same crime. This is what they did. This is how they did it. What would you like to sentence them to? And even from that, the results were staggering from just the different photos. Mm. It's a really good watch. 100 Humans, it's called, and they do loads of different things. One of the more lighter ones is they have to, uh, different age groups have to assemble flat back furniture. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting watch. Nice. But yeah, the results there are staggering. There's also one where um, they are shoot uh, a shooting range and different targets pop up. One target is holding a phone. One target is holding a gun. Again, different races. They pop up quickly, either holding a phone or a gun. And yeah, they measure which individuals shot which individuals. And it's, yeah, again, very insightful, but very Mm. scary. So Tom talked obviously about the Joe Karam uh, celebrity influence and and he he was massive, a massive sway in the way that this case eventually went. All of the trials and the retrial in total cost New Zealand taxpayers more than $11 million, making it the most expensive in New Zealand history. And if you are interested in this case, obviously we've condensed it quite a bit. Tom mentioned there's a, a long-running podcast about the case. There's there's huge amounts of information and content out there. There's also a 143-page first quarter of the official New Zealand Government Court of Appeals document, which gives a lot more kind of intimate details surrounding the case. It also has uh, a 42 points outlined by David, one of which we read at the start of the or Dan read at the start of the episode on his affidavit. And it's so interesting if you have got the time or if you are interested in this case so i will pop that in our in our facebook group for those that want to have a bit of a read and guys then if you hear a little little something but it's time for tommy's trivia whoa Ooh. tommy's trivia <laughs> that's terrific so i'm actually doing in america they call trivia a quiz trivia so i'm actually doing a quiz rather than uh, basically i've got a lot of love for new zealand uh basically all my siblings moved over there been them numerous times big fan so i reached out to some some friends over there as well to shout out to grant my brother-in-law my friend halsey and his fiance kim basically asked for some real kiwi words if you don't know kiwi is new zealanders are often referred to as kiwis uh kiwi words i don't want us to say them to you guys and then we'll just see if, if, if you know what they are brilliant love it Cool. So I'll start off easy and get, and get harder with it. So um, number one, jandals. Got an idea. Do we get them in context at all? I guess not. That'll give it away. No. So much, it? Flip-flops. Tick. Is it really? It is. Yeah. Well, it well done, Ben. Yeah. Chili bin. Arsehole. 
Sorry. Chili bin? Why don't I ask? I'll be I chili. Know. I don't know. Some it might be a bin. You're slugging things up there. Chili Mouth. bin. If you think about it literally. Cupboard. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, freezer. Cool box. Oh, yeah, that makes Oven. sense. Oven. <laughs> <laughs> a batch. I'm not saying batch. You're such a batch, but a batch. Like a batch of cookies. No, that's, I mean, that's just an English term. It's a oh. sentence, isn't it? Yeah. Spelt B-A-C-H, if that helps us all. Oh. Oh, going to the batch. I'm going for a batch. Pub. The language you used, the first one, damn, would make sense in this context. Beer? Yeah, no idea. Yeah. But it's, ho- it's a holiday home. You have a batch. Oh. Yeah. The last one you might get, you, I don't think you'll get this one. Chur. This one apparently is used a lot over there. I, I don't even think I've heard it over there, but apparently it's, it's one that's common. Bitch? Is it bitch? Bit, well, chur you, means bitch. You, you, you chur. Nasty old chur. Being sick after you've drunk a lot. <laughs> no. Oh. Uh, it's, it's a hello or thanks. So you'd be like, chur or chur. Oh. Which uh, I guess you say hello and thanks. So chur, chur. And the last one, this is, I like this one a lot. A tiki tour. A tiki tour. Is it a round of drinks? No, I like that, but no, it's not like that. It's going on a little journey with no real destination. She's going, a bit of, going on a quick tiki tour. So just kind of going out, maybe cruise. going for a drive, oh. or just going for a little wonder. Yeah, That's a little nice. tiki tour. Tiki tour. Yeah. Maybe go to a tiki tour with your chili bin, go into yeah. your batch. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Hope when you jandals. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, dear. But yes, that's a little bit of lightness at the end of this case because yeah, it's quite quite a quite a heavy one. I mean, Dan, obviously, we we have been very heavily leaning one way when we've been telling this whole thing, so I'm sure it's not unbiased in terms of how we've delivered it. Really, we've given you the other sides for Robin as well. But w- what camp are you in, Dan? Yeah, I can't see any other way than that, that David has murdered his family and got away with it. But I presume you're both in Camp David. Yeah, I think he did it. Yeah. I think there's more evidence, although, yeah, most of it got burnt down. I think there's more evidence against David than there was against uh, Jeremy Bamber for the White House farm. And he's still in prison, obviously. Yeah, it's true. I still find the burning of the house down crazy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Just looking there, there is a place called Camp David. It's a 125-acre country retreat. I thought there was. It rang a bell when you said Camp David. What about but Camp it- Daniel? Camp Daniel, growing opportunities for people with Jam-ja. disabilities. I love Camp Daniel. The people are friendly in a place like home. So yes, thank you so much for joining us again for this case. We'll be back next week with another case. And it's in tradition now. Um, and I know a lot of people enjoy it and love the jingle. Some people say, Dan, it's your best work. The jingle for this. <laughs> Did you see one comment saying that basically I didn't try at all with that jingle? <laughs> no, I didn't see that. <laughs> I can't remember. Someone basically said, oh, I could see how much effort was put into that jingle. <laughs> I saw someone say that that's someone your finest it work. Up. Yeah, yeah, someone really big. Really? It up. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. One man's rubbish is another man's um, crown. Mm. But uh, yes, so uh, Ben, over, over to you, sir. Benjamin Carter's cryptic clues. Everyone gather around for some cr- clues that can be quite cryptic, but he's going to give them to you anyway. Hope you can figure them out. So yeah, big uh, thanks for everyone with their guesses. There's been um, more more hits than misses in terms of um, people I did, guessing I did them. say the staircase when you emphasised the word stair, and then a lot of people go commenting going, when Ben emphasised the word stair, I, I got it. Ah, like, uh, okay. Yeah, a few, uh, few people got the Enfield haunting. A lot of people didn't get it. They guessed other cases, which was interesting. This one is for next week's case, of course. Ooh, uh, that's a strange number plate. I don't like it. Uh, no one's gonna get that. Yeah, I know. That is difficult. Yeah, yeah. Just a lot of throwing off the scent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so from that, yeah, I, I think you're going to struggle. Again. If anyone gets that, I'd be very uh, pleasantly surprised. Well, not surprised. It'd be show it's been an indictment on you as a person to get it. And yeah, the one, the one the week after next is uh, if anyone gets it, I'll buy them dinner because I've, I've really turned the cryptic notches up there. Oh, damn. <sighs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. How much are we saying for dinner? Hundred pounds, hundred pounds for dinner Bloody for hell. both of us. Or if oh, you don't want well? me to go, someone else can go with you for, for two. There you go. Well, there you, you heard go. it here first, folks. No one will get it unless you boys leak it. Well, though, you never said that. Anything. <laughs> so win a, win a dinner with Ben Carter. There you go. The plate liquor. Well, there you go. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again next week with a new case. Until then, like we always say, we say this all the time. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't bully people and piss on their airplane models. Don't burn out a fucking house. A crime scene. Yeah.
bottling too many fruits instead of looking after your children. Not that I'm, no, but look after everyone. All Guys, best. two Little bit. Bits. No, two bits mine. You get your own. Bang. Chair. AI. We'll sure. see you. Next time. <laughs> <laughs>